Okay, let's start. So, in the last class, uh, we looked at some of the non-idealities we'll have in the op amps and how it affects our switch capacitor circuits. So, basically, we looked at the effect of uh, DC offset, and by extension, we also see the saw the effect of Lika noise, and then uh, finite DC gain. And uh, the issue happens during the charge transfer phase in the switch cap circuits, which is where we needed the op amp to work properly. And uh, we saw that any non ideality in the op amp manifests itself as a non zero virtual ground voltage, right? So, we saw a, a couple of techniques to uh, suppress them, and the underlying principle of all the techniques is the same. You do something to try to make this node voltage where the two capacitors are connected like this, you want that to go to zero because if that goes to zero, the entire charge stored in this capacitor will get transferred here, right? And uh, we saw, I mean, broadly two kinds of techniques. One was the double sampling, correlated double sampling where we added a capacitor here to shift the potential here to close to zero. Similarly, we saw a correlated level shifting where the same shift was added at the output side. Right? And basically, uh, this DC gain effect can be tackled both by CDS and CLS, whereas the offset can only be corrected by CDS. Okay? And of course, in the in all our uh, calculations, we sort of assume that no charge is drawn out of these capacitors. Right? But in practice, of course, uh, you know, because of the parasitic capacitors here and here, some charge leakage will be there. So uh, ideally, we saw the gain increases from A to A square. But if we lose out, um, lose out some charge from these capacitors, it will be A square by some small factor. Okay. So let's uh, continue uh, along the same lines. When A square? Everything is A square. So this is our op amp. So let's say this is thing V1, V2. Say it has a gain of A, what is the output voltage in terms of the inputs? So A times V2 minus V1. So the way we have assumed the op amp, it fixes the output voltage based on its input voltages. So if I were to model this using a control source, what kind of control source I'll use? Voltage control? Voltage source, right? Output is a voltage. So and that is fixed based on sensing the input voltage. So this is PCVS. So now to uh, throw another truth bomb at you, uh, in practice on chip most of the times op amps are not implemented as VCVS, they are implemented as voltage control current source. So we no longer have a true op amp, it is an operational transconductance amplifier or OTA. So this is the symbol. So the difference is here the output current. I out is fixed as some transconnectance times V2 minus V1. Well, what to that? Why we saw in last course also, right? So there are a bunch of reasons why we uh, prefer doing this over this. I will give this as an assignment for you to work out and understand. I mean, simply speaking, we will be implementing all our amplifiers using MOS MOSFETs. And uh, a MOSFET, if I were to model in small signal, it's a voltage control current source. Drain current depends on gate to source voltage. Inherently, it's a VCCS. So it makes sense that it is much more natural to realize an OTA using a MOSFET. So if you were to make a VCVS, we have to do more additional stuff. Okay. Yeah. And also, I mean, let's say you take any MOS amplifier, right? Say you have a common source amplifier, simple common source amplifier. What does the DC gate? What is the gain of this guy? GM some GM times R naught, right? So yeah. any amplifier you make, it is some GM times some R out. If you want to have a large gain, what does it mean for the output resistance? Ideally, we want this to go to infinite, right? But for an op amp, a voltage controlled voltage source, what is the output resistance? It's a voltage source. So ideally, you want the output resistance to be zero. Whereas here the output is a current source, so you want to have an infinite output resistance. So let's see what happens if we try to use an OTA instead of an op amp in our circuits. So again, I'll take our vanilla switch cap amplifier as 
a test example. I will just draw the circuits in the two phases. So, in phase 1, what do we do to the input capacitor? We sample the input, the feedback capacitor is reset, right? In phase 2 is when we do the charge transfer. First, let us look at what happens with an op amp and then we will extend the discussion to an OTA. So, C1, C2. Now, if we have ideal switches, we saw that the output voltage sort of changes instantly from phase 1 to phase 2. Say in phase 1, the output was reset to ground. So, the output voltage will jump from 0. What will be the value it will settle to? Say switch cap amplifier, what is the output voltage? C1 by 0 times V in. So, it will instantaneously jump if you have ideal switches, right? So, which means the capacitor voltages are also changing instantly. If the capacitor voltage changes abruptly, what is the current flowing through the capacitors? Sorry? It is an impulsive current and this impulsive current will finally, uh, you know, fi fi must find a return path to ground. Where does it flow to? Let me just hold on, let me erase it. Yeah. Current comes here, but where does it finally end up to? It is sunk or sourced by the VCVS. Being an ideal voltage control voltage source, it can sink or source any current, we are fine. So, let us repeat the same with uh, VCCS. So, this is the OTA. Yeah. So, this is again phase phi 2. So, here do you think the capacitor voltages will change abruptly or not? Why not? Sorry? I mean, this is a current source, right? It can provide, isn't it? What is the problem? Uh, ah, correct. So, if I call this Vx, what is the output current? Minus Gm times Vx, right? So, if the capacitor voltages were to change abruptly, this impulsive current will have to be sourced or sunk by the uh, OTA. And if the current has a delta function, what can you say about Vx? Vx also must be an impulsive function, but that is not what we assume for the capacitor voltage, right? We assume capacitor voltage is a step jump, not an impulsive jump. So, just by contradiction, we can say it is not possible, right? I mean, other way to see is. Uh, see, uh, when I say it is a voltage control voltage source here, let us say this is V x and V out and let us say it has some gain A. The voltage gain from V x to V out, what is that voltage gain? Uh, it is minus A and this is constant across frequencies and irrespective of what you connect at the load, right. But let us say here, we will even assume that the op amp or the OTA is uh, ideal that is it has some transconnectance gm, but the output resistance it has is infinite. So, which means intrinsically the OTA itself has infinite gain across frequencies, right. But the moment I put it in feedback like this, what can you say about the voltage gain from Vx to Vout? What does it depend on? So, it depends on whatever you have connected at the output. Right now, what is connected at the output? Huh? So nothing is there or something is there? I mean, you have these guys, right? Isn't it? So, the voltage gain actually, although intrinsically this has infinite DC gain, the moment you put it, whatever you are connecting here is going to load the OTA, right? And at DC, what is the impedance offered by this guy? Huh? Infinite. So, what can you say about the voltage gain at DC? infinite, right? So, at DC, the voltage gain is still infinite, but at high frequencies, these guys will provide a short circuit and the gain will simply drop to 0, right? So, the point is, although this itself has intrinsically infinite gain at across frequencies, because of the fact that we are adding these capacitors here, the gain is strongly dependent on frequency. So, only the DC gain is infinite, 
So if the DC gain is infinity, what can you say about the steady state voltage? DC gain is infinite, so steady state voltages will be same as what you had with an ideal op-amp. So in steady state we are all fine, but because high frequency gain is really small, the OTA will not be able to instantaneously respond and make the output voltage go to the required voltage because it does not have infinite gain at high frequencies. Okay. So there is going to be some kind of transient and the output will only eventually settle to this value. Is that point okay? So let's find out how this uh, transient is going to look like. So now I'm interested in finding how output voltage will change as a function of time. So how will I proceed? How will I, how will I uh, you know, proceed or solve for it? I should use KCL. So this capacitor already had charged initial uh, voltage. So how can I model that? We can assume that we can have a series voltage source along with that and the capacitor was charged in this polarity so the voltage source sorry capacitor was charged to V in <coughs> in this polarity it was charged so it will also be something like this okay. and we will assume that it is some V in times U of T so in Laplace what does it become V in times U of T in Laplace domain if I, if I had to do it V in by S we can do KCL and solve it but let's take a more qualitative approach so that you think about it right you have capacitor charge to something in this polarity the voltage source will also be in this polarity so even the voltage source will be in this polarity okay. I mean you can uh, check back and see so let's try to get a get some qualitative feel so first of all, how many poles uh, the circuit has? Okay, I mean to find the pole location, input is not relevant, so I'll short the input. Yeah, so how many poles this guy has? I mean, how do you find the number of poles? It's basically the independent initial conditions you can set in the circuit. So I can basically set the initial voltage across this capacitor initial voltage across this capacitor so I can set two independent initial conditions at least properly so how many poles I have so ideally I should have two poles so now let's look at zeros to, uh, for zero the input location matters so I will just say this is some P in office okay so uh, how do you find the circuit has zeros, people who took 613 should remember. Yeah, but is there some other foolproof way we saw in the last week? Uh, yeah, so I mean people who have not taken 613, I will link you to the lecture to see, so that you understand what is the basis of this. But I will just tell the technique now. The deal is you take any circuit, if you can short any one of the capacitors in the circuit and the output is not zero, then there is one zero in the circuit. So here I can basically short either C1 or C2 and the output is still non-zero, right? So there is definitely one zero. If you have two zeros, what is the deal? You should be able to simultaneously short two capacitors at a time and the output should still be non-zero. If that is the case, the circuit has two zeros and then you can extend the same for multiple zeros also. So here if I short both C1 and C2 simultaneously, what is output? Why is, why is it zero? I mean, I am making, look at the connection, I am shorting these two. What is output? Output is same as input, so it is not zero. So how many zeros I should have here? I should have two zeros. Okay. And you can also qualitatively find the zero location. Maybe you can do that also. So, okay. we have time. so the deal is, again, everything is in Laplace. We know that at the zero frequency ZK, the output V out of S is 0. So this is basically 0. So if you apply KCL at this node, what do we get at the output node? 
if let us say this is vx of s, everything is in Laplace domain. So if I apply KCL at this point, what do I get? Current flowing in this direction is gm into vx of s plus current flowing in the capacitor is into sc2. Okay. So now we get vx of s times gm minus sc2 to 0. So two possibilities, either this is 0 or this is 0. So if the second term is 0, we get complex frequency s to be as plus gm by c2, which is indeed r0 frequency. And if you take this condition, we will get the second 0. So if let us say vx of s is 0, so which means this guy is 0. Now we apply KCL at this node. What do we get? C2 current flowing is 0. What is the current flowing in this direction? Minus Vn of S. C1. So obviously input is not 0. So what should be 0? So this, this is our second 0. Okay. So basically we have uh, one 0 at this guy and one more 0 at s equal to 0. And similarly qualitatively you can find actually that you will have one pole at s equal to 0. So what will eventually happen is uh, this pole at s equal to 0 will cancel this 0 at s equal to 0. So finally how many poles will have? We will eventually end up with one pole and one 0. It is not trivial if you just look at it but that is how it happens. So it is a simple first order circuit. right? So to find the output response of any first order circuit, what are the information I will require? If I want, it is a first order circuit, if I had to sketch or write the equation for the voltages in a first order circuit, what are the information I will need? You need time constant and what else? Initial voltage and final voltage, right? So if I know all these three things, I can write the expression or sketch the waveform. So let us quickly do that. Great. So this is phi 2. Remember in phi 1, the capacitor was charged to V in and C2 was reset. right? And remember, uh, let us try to find the initial voltage that is the voltage just at the beginning of phi 2. So I will call this phi 2 0 plus. So we know that already we saw that the capacitor voltages here cannot change instantly because uh, that will result in contradiction. So the voltage at the end of phi 1 in the capacitor C1 is what in this polarity? Now in this polarity what is the voltage across C1? Minus Vn. So at the end of phi 1 this is the voltage across capacitor C1. So just at the beginning of phi 2 the same voltage should be there. So if this is 0 what should this voltage jump to? I mean the voltage in this polarity should still be minus V in, right? So this is 0, so what should this be? Minus V in. Minus v in. So this will instantaneously become minus V in. By the same logic, what should output become? C. See, see, this was C2, right? In, in the previous phase, what was C2 charged to? Zero. So even now, what should the voltage? Zero. What is this guy? So what should this guy be? Minus V. So, so basically if I try to sketch this guy, so let us say this is time, this is Vx, this is the time instant at which we are changing the phase, so I will call this 0. So just at the beginning of this phase, the Vx will jump to minus V in. So similarly, if I plot V out, V out will also jump to minus V. And what is the steady state voltage for Vx? In eventually we saw it will behave like an op-amp with infinite gain. So this will settle to 0. And what about V out? What is the steady state value for output finally? C1 by C2 times V in. So let us say that is somewhere here. 
So it will just do some exponential thing like this. Fine. So only thing pending is to find the time constant. Let's do that also. We'll probably copy this. Yeah. So we have to. We are supposed to find the time constant now. And remember that this is eventually a first order circuit, right? So we just need to find the effective capacitance, effective resistance, take the product. But we have basically two nodes, but still it's a first order circuit. So we can find the effective resistance and capacitance at either of the two nodes, take the product, that will give the same time constant. Okay. So I'll do that for the output node plus, but you can take it as an exercise and work out the same at the input node. So right now the goal is to find the effective resistance and capacitance at this node. So at the output I want to find what is some R0 and C0. So how will I find? Yeah. We'll apply a test voltage or a test current, doesn't matter for LTA circuits. So let's say I call this test current. So if uh, this voltage is Vt, what is Vx? It's basically you see that between Vt and Vx we have a capacitive division and no current is drawn out of, sorry, no current is drawn here. So what is this voltage? C2 by C1 plus C2 times Vt. I will call this as beta times Vt, where beta is our feedback factor C2 by C1 plus C2. Fine. So what is the what is the current flowing in this direction? No, please check carefully. It's plus Gm. Okay. Remember, current flowing here is minus Gm times Vx. So current flowing uh, in the opposite direction is. So it's basically beta Vt times Gm. Fine. Great. And uh, what is the current flowing in this branch through C2? Yeah, but uh, is that something simple? We know that no current is being drawn out of here. So these two guys are in series essentially. So the series capacitance of these two. Fine? Is that okay? Because see, no current is being drawn from here. So it's as good as I'm putting these two guys in series. So, so the current here will be some Vt times C1, C2 by C1 plus C2. So now tell me what is the effective output resistance? I mean, remember that, see, if I apply a test voltage, maybe to clarify, if I apply a test voltage, the what is the current flowing here? Vt by R0, right? It's real current. And what is the current flowing here? Vt times Sc, that is the imaginary portion of the current. So if I look at the real portion of the current, that should give the resistor, right? So here this IT has two components. Which of the two is real? So beta, this guy is real. So what is the resistance then? 1 by beta gm. 1 by beta gm. I am applying a voltage Vt, getting a current of beta gm times Vt. So the output resistance is by beta gm. What is the capacitance? C1, C2 by C1 plus C2. At least the capacitance should make sense because if you look at the output node, you have only these two guys in series. Okay. So now if you find the time constant, it is 1 by beta gm times uh, this guy and in this case beta is also c2 by c1 plus c2 so things get cancelled what do I get finally that's our time constant I'll just say it's 1 by beta gm times c0 c0 is the total capacitance at the output okay Correct. Yeah, it is still correct, right? I mean, uh, the current flowing here is this, and that times this will be this guy. I mean, but see, the point is, even if you write KCL here, this is V test, this is Vx. If you write KCL at this node, what do you get? Vx times SC1 is the current. You rearrange it, you will get the same voltage division. 
see what, that doesn't depend on anything else as long as you don't draw any current here that is fine it's again like any impedance division you have any two impedances like this if this is v in this will be the di divided voltage as long as you don't draw any current from here okay cool great so uh, this is the deal so the takeaway is that even i mean the moment you have an ota even if the ota intrinsically has infinite gain the moment you put it in feedback like this the feedback and the load will uh, load the ota and that will uh, essentially uh, you know reduce the gain across frequencies so which means the ota will not be able to respond instantaneously and the output will only rise exponentially like this and remember that here we have not even considered the switch resistance the switches are still ideal right even then you will have this behavior but on the moment you actually take into account the on resistance of the switches this will become a higher order system it becomes messy to analyze but even then you will have basically a time constant corresponding to the on resistance of the switch you will have one time constant corresponding to 1 by beta gm times c and in practice in most cases what you will find is making r on smaller is much easier because making a small on resistance simply means i have to have a wide switch but if i were to make this guy smaller what should i do i have to increase gm so if i if i if i try to increase gm what do you think will happen to the power consumption that will also increase i mean even if you increase the switch size the power consumption by the clock buffers will increase but that might not be so much compared to this so in practice it is much easier to make switches with a very small on resistance so in most cases this guy will be the dominant time constant so usually you will have r on to be much much smaller than 1 by beta c <coughs> so in that case you can ignore the effect of on resistance in the phase phi 2 and assume you are completely limited by uh, this gm so which means the time constant here we have tau which is 1 by beta gm times c not how mu how must this be in comparison to the time available for settling okay. should be much much less than this so you should design your gm so that you meet this condition is that okay great so in this actually calculation we didn't consider any capacitance at the load right what is it yeah any consider the we didn't consider load capacitor so let's quickly repeat what happens if you have a load capacitor which will be the practical scenario so only change is i'm adding a load capacitor here so let's again repeat the same thing let's try to find the number of poles and zeros so if i in this circuit how many poles or how many initial conditions i can set independently two because here if i set the initial voltage across e1 and let us say i set the voltage across e2 the voltage across cl is basically sum of these two i don't have a provision to set all three independently i can only set two of them at a time independently so we still have two poles so let's look at zero so i'm having cl here we already know that i can short two capacitors simultaneously in the circuit and still get a non zero output so there are two zeros so what happens if we short all three at the same time output is zero so there is no three zeros so we have only two zeros so this is also fine and even if you try to find the zero locations will anything change i am trying to put i mean the way i got the zero location was i applied kcl at the output node which is this node so will the equation change here no because output itself is zero so no current will be drawn through cl so this equation will not change this will not change so zero location will also be the same okay and you will again find that you will have one pole at s equal to zero so these two will cancel and you will still end up with this and the effect of this cl is the change in the pole location you will have one more pole right that we have not computed that pole location will change that's all okay so nothing major changes say, that is equal to you can say qualitatively say you can qualitatively find out i mean for people who have taken this miller ota you should be able to find it 
but otherwise you can take it for granted for now. You think about it, right? I mean, for people who have learnt Miller or Pams, this is similar to the Miller OTA, right? There is very minor differences, so you can go back and see what are the you know, uh, parallels. So now it's a first order system. The next thing is to find initial, initial voltage, final voltage, and time constants. So let's do that. Okay, let's start with initial voltage. Let me erase all these. Yeah. So this is the circuit at the end of the phase phi one. Now the circuit changes to phi two. At t equal to zero plus, I'm interested to find what the voltages are. So here, do you think? Uh, will there be any abrupt changes in capacitor voltages? Okay, before that I have a CL here, I will mark that. Will there, be, will there be instantaneous changes in capacitor voltages? Why not? Okay, same, let us reason the same way. If the capacitor voltage, huh? yeah, here when I change from phi 1 to phi 2, will there be any instantaneous jump in capacitor voltage? Yeah, let us figure out. So. Again, the logic is same. If the capacitor voltage changes instantly, current is impulsive. This impulsive current comes here. So earlier, we did, when we didn't have CL, this was the only path, and that's why we contradicted. But now, is there some other path for the current to flow? It can flow through CL, and it, indeed, it will flow through CL, and you will have impulsive currents flowing through the capacitors, and there will be sudden jumps in capacitor voltages. This is very similar to you know you have let's say a capacitor charged to some voltage. And you take another uncharged capacitor, put the two in parallel, the effective voltage will jump instantly, you will have instantaneous charge transfer. That is assuming ideal switches, which is the same case we have. Okay. So the voltage at t equal to 0 plus, we will see a sudden jump and we figure out what the jump is. And at t equal to 0 plus, we just saw the current will only flow through the capacitors. So what can you say about the current flowing out of the OTA? It will be 0. The OTA will not respond at t equal to 0 plus. That should also be logical because the OTA does not have you know infinite gain at infinite frequency. So it cannot respond instantaneously. At t equal to 0 plus, it is as good as not having the OTA then. This only at t equal to 0 plus. Is that okay? So now I am interested to find what the voltage is at uh, this time instant. So how will I proceed? In the previous phase, I know what the circuit configuration is. I am just switching over to this phase. I am interested to find what are the voltages in this phase. How will I start? start, start Charge. Uh, uh, at that point, it cannot supply current, but just after t equal to 0 plus, it will supply. Uh, correct, correct. Correct. We only after V X changes, it will respond, right? I mean, it's all like very instantaneous time instance, right? At t equal to zero plus voltage changes, and then it it will start responding. Yeah. Okay. So we'll again, do charge conservation because we have impulsive currents. So this is my favorite note. So if I apply V uh, charge conservation here, what do I get? Again, I'll apply. These are the capacitors connected. So these are the stuff. So what do we get? In phase one, what are the voltages? Or let's say in phase two, uh, plus. Yeah, I mean Vx minus V out times uh, C two. But see, to simplify things, you see these two guys are in series, right? It, I can eliminate V out from this. So what can I do? Yeah, it's the two capacitors in series. I mean, you can also do the other way, but this way I will eliminate V out from the equation. This will be equal to the charges stored in the same plates minus C V in. Okay. So the charge stored in this plate is minus C V in, this plate it is 0. Here go. Great. So here you can find what Vx is then. Vx will be minus C1 by C1 plus. And sanity check if CL is 0, what happens to this? I mean, what happens to this guy? Minus V in. And that's what you also did before. So, right now it will not be minus V in, it will be some minus K1 times V in. 
and that k1 is the factor that we have computed. So now we have found out vx. I know what is vx. Can I tell what v out is? What is it? What is the relation between vx and v out? It's a capacitive division, but is it what is the factor? It is c2 by c2 plus cn. Okay. So v out will be c2 by c2 plus cl times vx whose value we computed now this guy so i mean you can actually simplify this to a nice looking expression like this by cl plus c1 c2 by c1 plus so so now v out will not jump to minus v in it is jumping to some other voltage let us say that is minus k2 times v in so initial voltage is known, final voltage is known, we will find the time constant, which is this case, yeah. I will repeat the same calculation here quickly. Let me erase all this. So the only change in the circuit is basically I am having another capacitor CL at the load. This capacitor comes in parallel. So what changes? Will the resistance change? The capacitor is simply added at the output side. So the output capacitor will be this plus CL. Okay. So this will not be this. This will be this guy plus CL. But all the other things will be same. Is that okay? Okay. Cool. So again, uh, these jumps will be from minus K1 V in. This will be. In a K to E. Great. So now uh, we will discuss one other issue with OTA here. So we will erase all these. Erase this also. We draw the circuit again. Great. So now we have uh, sketched what is Vx is, right? Vx is this voltage, this is V out. If this has a transconductance GM, what is the current flowing out of the OTA? What is I out of T? So minus Gm times Vx of T. So if I try to sketch the output current, how will it look like? If I sketch I out. Yeah, this gets flipped over, sign changes and we will have a scaled version of it. So we will also draw that. So it will, what will be this value? K1 V in times Gm, right? I will just write it as K1 times Gm V in and then it will decay exponentially like this. Fine, same thing. Okay. So at what time instant we are demanding maximum current from the OTA? At this jump, at t equal to 0 plus is when the circuit is demanding maximum current from the OTA and that maximum current is k1 times gmv. Now remember in most, most of the common implementations for this OTA, you will have this kind of differential pair bias with the tail current source. This is one of the common implementations. I am sure everyone would have seen this in one form or the other. So this has a, this trans connector has a bias current of I0, right? So if the current demanded, which is K1 GMV in, is less than the current available in the OTA, we are all okay. The OTA can provide that current. But let us say the current that is being demanded in the circuit is much greater than the current available in the OTA. What will happen? Let us say uh, this is the current I0 that is available in the OTA. Somewhere here. What will happen? 
yeah i mean the point is the uh, we are demanding a lot of current from the ota but the ota is having only finite amount of current so it will completely max out so entire current will get redirected to the output to charge the output so the current that will be supplied will be constant i not right so now you see that uh, the input voltage vx is something but the current we are providing is constant so it is no longer responding to the input voltage so it is no longer a voltage controlled current source what kind of source is it it's a constant current source i not okay so at that point you can think of this as it's not a ota just a current source and the current value is i not and when okay and this thing is called slowing okay and the ha huh. okay yeah, just after t equal to 0 plus yeah i mean this t equal to 0 plus just after t equal to 0 plus it's all like you can't draw on paper right what will happen in practice is at t equal to 0 plus instantaneously vx will change and once this changes the ota tries to pump in that much amount of current but it cannot provide that much amount of current so all the current will be directed these are not happening instantaneously but like you know sequentially but we can't draw it on paper great so now we are pumping in a constant current i not and that current is pumped up into the output node so how will the output change constant current i not pumped into the output which has only capacitors so it will rise linearly and what is the total capacitors at the total capacitance at the output we already found that it is basically this capacitor in parallel with the series combination of these two which which is what we called as c not okay this is cl plus so the output will jump to this guy the output will initially jump to this voltage and then it will not rise exponentially it will length be linearly yeah so here if i were to write the expression for v out it is initially starts with minus k to v in and then increases linearly and the slope is i not by c not times t right so if uh, similarly if i write for vx vx initially starts from minus k1 v in right and if the output is increasing linearly what can you say about vx that should also increase linearly and uh, if output increases at this rate at what rate will vx increase i mean what is the relation between v out and vx right so if the output changes at this rate vx will change at that rate times beta beta is the feedback factor so vx will change as some beta times right so this guy will also do this until okay till what time will have this slowing will this continue forever or it will stop something it will stop when the current to give the current right the yeah so basically the current demanded in the circuit is minus gm times vx of t now the issue is happening because the current we have is much smaller than that so the moment vx comes to a voltage when that is when minus gm vx of t is just equal to i not we are all okay so i will say this is the time at which slu stops slowing stops so i'll call t slu at the time instant where the slowing stops this will be the condition right and you guys know what is uh, vx of t right and based on these two you can find what is the time at which slowing stops but the point i want to make is when slowing stops vx of t is minus i not by gm right so let us say this is that minus i not by gm so basically it will continue till this point and slowing stops okay so beyond this point it will be able to supply the current so current will drop exponentially and this will also increase exponentially like this same is the case with output i mean there will not be sudden jumps it will be a nice smooth waveform but i am just drawing it first 
So now, I mean, you can find out what this T slew is, but uh, do you think this T slew will it depend on the input or not depend on the input? That T slew is the time for which the OTS loose. So this time, do you think will depend on the input or not? It will depend on the input. It's simply because here uh, we saw that slowing happens till Vx reaches this point, right? Now Vx starts from minus k1 times Vn. If Vn was higher, it will start from this point. It will rise at the same rate, so it will slow till this point. Okay. And in fact, if Vn was very small, the current required by the OTA, I mean, current required by the circuit might be really small than the current in the OTA. You might not have an issue at all. So the point is, this uh, time for which slowing happens is a strong function of the input. So maybe I will have to go to the next page, let me copy this. This is this loop. This V out. So let us say this is time t equal to 0. So this is the time at which slowing stops, I will call it t slow. And this is the end of the time which is t equal to ts by 2 right we already know during this time the output increases linearly we have already written the expression now after the slowing stops the output rises exponentially and i mean i'll roughly write during the exponential phase it will be something minus something into e power minus t by 2 right but the slowing is starting i mean the exponential settling is starting only after t equal to t slow so how will this thing change it will be t minus t slew, that's all, right? So it will not start from t equal to 0, it's starting after a delay of t slew. Fine? And we are interested in the settled voltage, which is this guy. So what time, uh, what value of t I should put here? T s by 2, right? So I will replace this with t s by 2. So here you will see that this guy will finally have an expression which is something into t slew by tau. This thing will be there, right? And we already know this is a strong function of the input. So what do you think this will result in? It will directly result in non-linearity because you have e power something d in that straight away non-linear, right? So this will straight away introduce non-linearity. So that's the problem with slow. Now, if I were to reduce the non-linearity, what should I do from here? I should reduce the time for which this slowing happens. But the residual thing, you still have this, isn't it? This is the final output. The What I have written is the settled value. The settled value has e power t slew by tau. What is settled? No, you will have something. But the point is, you will have some, it won't exactly settle, isn't it? There will be a small error. It will never settle to the final value, right? So, we will have an error, and that error will depend on this guy. And that t slew is non linear function. So, you are saying t. Understood? See, it, it, this is the final value, but uh, in, in nowhere it will reach the, this guy, right? It will always be something here. And this guy will in, indeed depend on time for which you have let the slowing. Right? Because let us say this complete time you are exponentially settling, you will do this. Let us say till this point you are slowing and then settling from here. Maybe this is a more exaggerated case. So let us say you are slowing till this point and then exponentially settling, you will settle with a more error, right? And that error, and that error is what I have written here loosely and that has a factor which is e power t slew by tau. t slew is a function of the input, this straight away results in nonlinearity. And if I were to reduce this non-linearity, the only option I have is to go and reduce the time for which we are slowing. And how can I reduce this slow in the OTA? Ah, I mean, because if you think about it, the one, the reason why slowing is happening in the first place is we have the some current is demanded by the circuit, 
and our i not is not matching that so if i were to have a very large i not we might not even have slowing in the first place right so the only way to reduce this time for which slowing happens is you have to increase i not so if i were to reduce this guy which means i have to reduce this loop which means i have to increase i not So usually, I mean, if you uh, one not so bad starting point for a design is let us say this is the total time available for you, T S by two. You can say I'll dedicate half the time for slowing and half the time for exponential settling. And you find that uh, having this much time for slowing is not enough for your linearity. You can go and reduce this for you. This might not be a bad starting point for design. Great. So uh, the bottom line of this discussion is, the moment you replace an op-amp with a practical OTA, because of the fact that the OTA, I mean the uh, feedback capacitors will load our OTA, will not have infinite speed, so the output will only exponentially settle with a time constant, which is one by beta g m times c naught, and c naught is this guy. So you should make sure this time constant is much much smaller than T S by two, and you should design your G M based on that. And uh, we also saw this is valid as long as my on resistance is much much smaller than on the beta G M. So you should also size your on resistance accordingly. Okay. And the second thing is with respect to slowing, we will definitely have slowing. We cannot prevent it. And to reduce it, you go and increase I not. So uh, the settling condition will set what GM value you need to have, and the non-linearity and the slowing will set will decide what is the value of I not you should have for your GM. Okay. Yeah. Right. Uh, no, no. Output is a straight line. No, no. This this is a straight line, right? What I'm talking about is this time. I mean, time is a function of the input. Whether it's non-linear or linear, that you can find out from solving these guys. It is a function of the input, but finally, this comes in the exponential. Yeah. Okay. If it's properly slowing, it will be linear. But in practice, see, uh, you will also have. In practice, let us say this has some finite output resistance, then it won't be exactly linear. Right now, we assume the OT has infinite output resistance; it's all fine. If not, you'll have, yeah. Why is the transistor with the MOS MOS transistor? Ah. I, I, I'm not able to hear. Uh, ah. Correct. 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 Voltage bias. Then it should be okay. <laughs> you need to make sure you have good common mode rejection somehow, right? That is one of the reasons why we have the stale source. It, Okay, I mean you are you understand the fact that if your bias current is limited, there is going to be this linear behavior, right? So only after some time we will have exponential settling, and uh, the time for which this linear behavior happens will be dependent on the input. That's all you need to understand. Is that clear? See, because if the input is very small, right? Then the current demanded is GM times something, GM times V in. That might be much smaller than your current in the OTA. So in that case, there will be no slowing, right? Only if the input is very large. For your maximum input is when you will have slowing. So the slowing time will depend on the input. And once that's a function of the input, the rest should follow. Okay. Cool.